One way of looking at the ritual is as a blueprint crafted by our founders and early leaders. Their intent was that Kappa Delta would travel to places they might never go and that it would touch generations they wouldn't live to see. It was Kappa Delta for me right from the beginning. Kappa Delta began as the dream of four young women on a rainy day in October 1897. Saturday at State Female Normal School meant no classes, and the dreary weather that hung over Farmville, Virginia was a perfect excuse for Lenora, Sarah, Mary, and Julia to tuck themselves away in their cozy dormitory room. The sorority was founded during a time when women had yet to win the right to vote. As some of the earliest members to pursue higher education in this country, they were adventurers and visionaries, embracing the spirit of the age in which they lived. They were absolutely all about the empowerment of women back then. They were taking the values they had learned and trying to be sure that they were carried forward, I think. Lenora Ashmore, the fanciful one, had an idea she shared with her friends, an idea to form a sorority. The idea took hold, and the four began to dream of turning their friendship into something greater, something far-reaching. At 17 years old, Lenora, or Nora as she was known, was a romantic. Idealistic and imaginative, she was drawn to causes and was known for putting her convictions into practice. It's not surprising she was the one to first suggest a sorority. Sarah Turner was the daughter of a Virginia State Senator. She was only 15 and one of the youngest on campus. Sagey, as she was called by friends, took great interest in social life and is thought to be the magnet that pulled the founders together. Mary Somerville Sparks was the oldest at 23. Mary had a maturity of judgment coupled with a rare and essential goodness. A Bible study teacher, she was known to be Kappa Delta's first spiritual leader. Her kind, fair, and sympathetic disposition endeared her to virtually everyone who knew her. Mary stayed at State Normal longer than any of the other founders and became a guiding light to the group. Julia Gardner Tyler was a combination of charm and brains. A talented artist, she illustrated the school's yearbook and designed the Kappa Delta badge. She also came up with a secret motto, AOT. She was the granddaughter of former U.S. President John Tyler and daughter of the president of the College of William and Mary. Julia was an extremely positive woman. If she wanted it, she got it. Julia was slightly undaunted. They understood each other, they loved each other, but they were as completely different as you could possibly be. Sincere friendship, youthful idealism, and strong values were the catalysts that helped to form the sorority we know today. They picked women that they admired and they respected, and they felt good about themselves when they were with them, and we still do that. The sorority's early leaders played an important role in strengthening the foundation of Kappa Delta. Eunice Spears and Emma Greer were initiated just 10 days after the founding. Our founders were looking for women that would add value to our young sorority. Less than two weeks later, 18-year-old Julia Wedby Vaughn was initiated and soon became the sorority's first president. One of the most popular students on campus, Dulcie, as she was nicknamed, distinguished herself in almost all leadership opportunities available on campus, including Kappa Delta. She set about to get the sorority properly organized, leading the group to write a constitution and its first ritual, and helping to secure Kappa Delta's official charter. Kappa Delta gave so many women an opportunity to try something and figure out that, you know what, I'm very good at that. By 1900, at the age of 20, Genevieve Bacon Venable Holiday was elected Grand Head and served as the first national president. She was the perfect lady. Everything was precise and important. It was during that time Kappa Delta adopted its object and open motto. In 1904, Kappa Delta was incorporated as a national entity and the first wave of expansion took place. 
Beta Chapter at Chatham Episcopal Institute joined Alpha Chapter at State Normal. Then five more chapters were added before the first national convention was held at the Jefferson Hotel in Richmond, Virginia in December 1903. The convention body confirmed the decision to make Kappa Delta a national sorority rather than a regional one. The constitution, ritual, coat of arms, seal and badge were formally adopted. It also made the decision to publish a magazine, The Angelus, which is still published today. The Angelus was set up originally to be a benefit of membership. I don't recall in those early years that they ever covered a controversial topic. It was more of just a friendly communication among sisters. The following conventions tackled a variety of important decisions. The name Kappa Delta was copyrighted, a pledge education program was introduced, and alumni chapters were approved. A grip, whistle, and pledge pin were adopted. Time and again, Kappa Delta early members would prove to be selfless leaders and devoted members. The women who lead this sorority are very dedicated to its future. It was never as apparent as when the sorority began discussing joining the National Panhellenic Conference, an association for fraternal women's organizations. NPC required all chapters to be at four-year institutions, which meant the sorority would have to surrender some of its chapters, Alpha one of them. The overarching principle was is that yes, in order for Kappa Delta to grow, for Kappa Delta to be better, for Kappa Delta to even survive, we had to become a part of the National Panhellenic Conference. Ultimately, it was the women of Alpha Chapter that voted to relinquish their charter, but how heartbreaking. After years of debate and anguish, in 1912, Alpha Chapter, along with Sigma at Gunston Hall, relinquished their charters with a statement for greater love for Kappa Delta. During that time, the Alpha Trunk containing documents, minutes, and records from Kappa Delta's early years was stored in the attic of the college president's home and was forgotten. It was later discovered and returned to Kappa Delta in 1937 with the original documents still inside. In 1949, Alpha Chapter was reactivated. Everybody who had an important office and National Kappa Delta descended upon Farmville. And they also said they were bringing the trunk. <laughs> and we wondered what the trunk was, but we found out that it had all the treasures. As early as 1902, with the adoption of the sorority's object, Kappa Delta's early leaders confirmed their commitment to the furtherance of charitable and benevolent purposes. In 1921, Kappa Delta adopted its first national philanthropy, the Crippled Children's Hospital in Richmond, Virginia, located not far from where the sorority was founded. The original Kappa Delta gift in year one was $600, and that bought a lot of beds. You can imagine in the 1920s, you know, where now a bed costs $2,000. It's been very special because we do not have any relationship older than Kappa Delta. With the onslaught of the polio epidemic came Kappa Delta's interest in supporting its second national philanthropy, orthopedic research. Support for these historical philanthropies continues today. Since 1981, Kappa Delta has been a proud supporter of Prevent Child Abuse America, an organization founded by Donna Stone, one of our very own Kappa Delta sisters. And she was so passionate about child abuse, which was an unheard of discussion at that time. Nobody talked about it, nobody knew anything about it. She met with us for about two hours and we were hooked. March 17, 1984, we raised $42,500 for the National Committee. I thought it was a pretty good beginning and I personally presented the check at the NCPA annual meeting and gave it to Donna Stone. 
1988 can be a year of celebration if we put an end to child abuse. Good morning, America! From that time on, we've been active supporters, both on the local and the national level of the prevention of child abuse. Most recently, in 1998, Kappa Delta adopted Girl Scouts of the USA as a national philanthropy. When I grow up, I want to be a Kappa Delta. We felt it was important that we find an organization that would enable us to sort of mentor down and to give back to our community by working with young girls. You know, who we were really sold us to Girl Scouts, and it's become a very strong national partnership. Today, members continue to live out the vision of the founders. I think the founders would be amazed at the focus of this organization on women's achievements and women's confidence. We are builders of women in every way. Well, it's meant a lot. It has. And yes. the standards have never changed. They've always been high, and I want them to continue to be high. The majority of my inspiration came and comes from women. Regardless of the fact that we come from different places, different backgrounds, and yes, different eras, Kappa Delta is stronger now more than ever. It is the responsibility and privilege of each member of Kappa Delta to strive for that which is honorable, beautiful and highest as we carry on the legacy of our founders. The dream of four young women has become our reality. So among the dreams of memory to which we must hold fast is the awareness that we are better Kappa Delta today because of the great toilers who came before us. What I've learned from Kappa Delta, it's made me a better person. I would have hated to have missed that journey. To be a part of Kappa Delta is something I'm still appreciative of, so thank you. Those who created the gift of Kappa Delta wanted us to know this, that life is hard and fun and scary and wondrous, and that our sisters, our impossible, beautiful sisters, can make an immeasurable difference in the quality of who we become and in what we contribute to the world. Let us press forward toward the prize, a greater and better Kappa Delta. Delta.